Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne-Rowe, author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. You know, I work in education. I think education is woefully inadequate at preparing teenagers for pressure. I think education prepares you for content. It doesn't prepare you for how to manage when you're under pressure. My guest today is Alan Jones, a teacher with more than 20 years experience, the last 16 of which have been spent as a school leader. He's currently head of a comprehensive school in South West London. I had the pleasure of working with Alan just before the pandemic when he was working at Fulham Cross Girls School. He invited us to work with the girls on supporting them as they prepared for the pressure of exams. In this conversation, he talks about the difference between boys and girls' reactions to the pressure of exams, anticipating Ofsted, and the inexplicable power of an orange tie. Alan, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and talk to me about pressure, a subject that you and I have spoken about quite a lot, I think, in the past. So it's very exciting to have you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It'd be interesting. I, I always quite enjoy these kind of conversations. Well, good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think we should uh, crack on straight in. Alan, maybe we could start with um, how do you experience pressure now? I think in, in the day job, uh, we, just, we just get thrust into pressure situations all the time. Uh, so the last two years have been pretty pressured in education, just having to react to um, whatever's been thrown at us quite, quite short term. You have very little lead in. And so you have to get used to just dealing with things very quickly. Um, and then sort of more, more widely than that, you know, in education, you've always got the threat of Ofsted looming. That's very pressured for, for schools, but sort of more on a day-to-day -day basis, um, numerous HR issues, irate parents, uh, difficult conversations, potentially with legals, lots and lots of opportune moments where pressure can sort of raise its head um, and I think part of kind of my role is really trying to sort of manage that both for myself, but also for the, for the school, for the institution to sort of uh, make it doable. I see that as a large part of what I do. Um, and when pressure hits my sector, it's almost trying to sort of minimise the knock on effect to perhaps other colleagues or certainly to the students and the family. So, yeah, it's kind of one of those things that you kind of have to become uh, au fait with, I think. Yeah, gosh. And you know, what you've described there are just so many different bodies of audiences that get hit by that pressure. And I think that's what's so significant. And particularly at the moment with education, you've not only got everything coming in left field, as you've just said, with no preparation, but you've also got to <laughs> lead yourself and others through that. So let's start with you first, Alan. So, you know, how, how long have you been in education now? Just remind me. Uh, 21 years. This is my 21st year in education. Yeah. OK, so if we just stick to the day job, which is the education job, how, how have you how have you dealt with that never ending um, pressure for you as a teacher first and now obviously as a head teacher? Just just talk talk us through that evolution of pressure for you. I think when you're sort of new to the profession, the pressures you have are very different to when you've been doing it for a while. Uh, when you're very new, the pressures are just day to day. How are you going to survive a group of children coming into your care and get them to learn something and, and not cause havoc? And I, and I don't mean that in any kind of like detrimental way. That is something that is quite pressured when you come out of university and you realise that it's you on your own and there isn't another adult who's going to help guide you through that and I think you know I don't want to ever forget the early years of teaching when the pressure was just trying to get the day job and there's a huge turnover in education I think statistically most teachers leave within five years and that is because of the nature of the role and the mm. fact that it is it is quite full on um, and then as you sort of move through various levels of leadership um, I think that pressure just becomes different I don't think it's it's kind of, um, of course, there are more public pressures that come with leadership, but the pressure is just a different form of pressure. You become responsible for other adults as well as the children in your care. And then when you get to sort of more senior leadership, obviously, it's more about strategy, direction and accepting that um, it hits you when, when it hits the fan, it hits you. So you've got to be ready to sort of, you know, take that on the chin um, when really pressured moments come to you. 
And how do you recognize a really pressured moment? <laughs> two types. I, I would argue there are two types of pressure. There's foreseen pressure, as in mm. you know it's coming. So you've got that meeting looming that you just is it, going to be difficult and you might have to sort of um, stand your ground or or sort of argue a point. There, there's that kind of pressure which can loom over you. And I think you have to manage that in a certain way. And then you have kind of pressure that's unforeseen. So you're all of a sudden thrust into a situation sort of with no notice. Mm. And you've just got you've just got to deal with what's in front of you. And I think in, in our world, I'm sure it's probably the same in lots of sectors. Um, they can come at any time. So I sort of see pressure in, in two ways. Those that those that you know are on the agenda and on the calendar and are coming and those that just rear their head out of nowhere. Um, and you've just got to kind of manage it. And, and what's your strategy for both of those? Because I think that's a really helpful distinction there. In fact, you know, <clears throat> that sense of. Um, pressure over time which you know I think for education it's 18 months or so now that you've been dealing with this pandemic and and the way that things have changed during that time that's been sort of a long-term pressure but with its moments of pressure I, I'm sure within that um, but but those moments where you it comes left field and you don't expect it or you can't have an, you, you haven't anticipated it what's your what's your personal strategy Alan for dealing with those two different types that you discuss there Describe so that. if I do if I do the one where I know it's coming, if yeah. I take that one first, because actually okay. on 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 some levels I think that that can be harder, um, and I think it can be harder because of humans' nature to overthink, and you will give things a narrative that perhaps are not fair. You'll give mm -hmm. people a voice that perhaps isn't even what they're thinking. So I think managing something that you know is looming can be really difficult because it can plague you for several days before that meeting happens. And in our world, say it's something HR related, a colleague has five days notice of that meeting. So therefore the minimum you're gonna have is to worry about your management of that moment is five days. You know, you've got to try and think about that for five days. Um, so I sort of take myself through a process. Uh, mm. I've, never actually, I've never actually said this out loud. Um, right. so, <laughs> so what I do is um, say I've got something coming that is like five, six days away. I first of all try to take the pressure off myself by thinking about the content of what I'm going to say. And I get the kind of the what in my head. And that allows me to sort of take away some of the worry because I've already started to rehearse and I might even jot down, I usually do jot down some of the things that I intend to say in that difficult conversation, difficult meeting, whatever it may be. Um, so that's the first thing I do. And then probably two days before I go into that conversation, that meeting, whatever the moment of pressure may be, I stop learning content and I start, start thinking about how I want to manage myself. Okay. I think about my triggers and what you know sometimes if I'm if I'm dealing with legals they might want me to be triggered so I need to yeah. think about how I'm going to manage myself you know yeah. I would think about almost how I'm going to enter the room the posture I want to take where I want to sit yeah. where around the table I want to be and I start actually thinking about the management of me in that situation rather than what a lot of people seem to focus on is the what they're going to say and then they lose control of themselves and none of it comes out because they've allowed it to kind of, you know, fall mm. apart in that situation. So when I've got those moments that I have to build up to, it is genuinely a process that I sort of have walked myself through um, with however long I've got between when I know it's coming and when it happens. Um, and then if it's an out of the blue, a left field issue that I've got to deal with, I, I kind of have stock phrases that mm -hmm. I use um almost almost to give myself thinking time um i will say i, I learn certain phrases for my sort of what i say in my head my self-talk okay so one one of my favorites is respond don't react mm -hmm. and that's to just kind of allow me to keep what i what i would call playing the pause so i'm, I'm whatever someone is saying i'm saying to myself respond don't react and i'm mm -hmm. just gathering my thoughts gathering what i want to respond with rather than give um, a sort of an almost hormonal or adrenaline or kind of testosterone fueled response. So I'm just reminding myself to just pause in the moment. Um, and that's something that I have to do quite a lot because a lot of, you know, I might, I might have a parent who's angry about a situation that's arisen 
and yeah. I might be the person they're talking to and they won't intend it to be personal or a go at me but you know they they, they sometimes I'm the first person that gets that so I've yeah. got to think about how I you know you can't meet aggression doesn't get met with aggression and end well aggression yeah. needs to be met with calm so yeah. I need to be the calm in that situation so yeah I kind of stop phrases self-talk more so yeah. when it's in the moment and then when I've when I've got a lead in I sort of take myself through the process Great. Wow. That sounds like that has been um, well honed <laughs> over the years. And I, and it makes me think, Alan, what, what can you talk about? Where's been the, what's been the worst pressure for you? I think to say it's well honed is definitely fair, but I would say um, also learn through error. I think okay. that's, I think there's a lot, yeah. what, my younger self perhaps wasn't so refined in that. And I perhaps did react in a way that was probably less helpful to the situation. I think, but looking back and reflecting on that is really, really key. And actually yeah. just, you know, constantly learning how to manage that differently. I think, you know, constant reflection is key. But um, in terms of the most pressure, I, I would say in my world, it's always with adults. It's always whether it's a, an exclusion panel and you've got legals trying to make you out to be biased or to try and make the school seem like it's acting in an unfair manner. I've had I've had that on a number of occasions HR related issues, um, you know, colleagues will often look to, if they've got themselves into difficulty, they'll often look to project rather than look inwardly. Uh, and yeah. that can sometimes be targeted at whoever's challenging, whatever the situation may be. So usually my pressure is actually with adults. It's not so much with children, um, even though I'm in education, because to be fair, most children, um, <laughs> they, they've got some learning to do. And actually, if you give them time to cool down, they're usually quite quite reflective but um I, adults sometimes I think aren't necessarily as strong as that so yeah yeah lots yeah, yeah. lots of situations and and can you imagine can you remember when you first felt pressure I'm so um I'm trying to sort of capture from as many conversations as possible how people recognize that it's pressure how people recognize that it's pressure that's something you can do with something with or the pressure that actually limits you uh, and how you guide <laughs> the result of that. Um, and I'm just wondering, I'm asking everyone I speak to actually is, when do you first remember feeling a sense of pressure? Genuinely, I can still remember it as a, as a young sports person. Um, okay. In, in things like cup finals, in, you know, county tournaments. I still have vivid recollections of, of those moments. Vivid recollections of um, first time you have to sit external examinations. I, I, I still remember my experience at GCSE, at A-level, you know, as a teenager. I still remember those quite vividly. Um, like I said, early years of teaching, um, First steps into management leadership, I think I still remember those quite vividly. Um, being put under pressure by leaders uh, who I've worked with, um, mm -hmm. who were being challenging of me or challenging about me or, you know, and perhaps not always in the most tactful or or subtle of ways. But I think the earliest memories would, would probably date back to um, teenage sports person, GCSE years. I think I can still remember quite clearly that being probably the first time I remember pressure being something that I had to manage. And and did that experience enable you to literally the title of this podcast be better under the pressure, or through the journey did it actually limit your performance and really significantly go the other way? And how how did you redress that? Because it sounds like you really use it very positively now. It may not necessarily be easy, but you recognise it and you can work it through into something that actually allows you to be better but I'm, I'm just so curious about this journey that we all go on to turn what could actually take us out of the game back into keeping us in the game firstly I've actually grown to actively like it I actually don't mm. I, I actually probably now I don't seek it I never look for it but when it comes I see it almost as that's what that's what my role is that's what I get paid to do that's what I want to do that's how I want to protect you know I, see, I sort of feel like that that is something that that I can bring to the table um I think if I think back to the early years of, of when I felt it as a teenager um you know I work in education I think education is woefully inadequate at preparing mm -hmm. teenagers for pressure I think education prepares you for content it doesn't prepare you for how to mm -hmm. manage 
when you're under pressure. And that's why, you know, I've seen countless students over the years, very bright young people fall apart in examinations because it's in their head, but they can't put it on paper when it matters. And I think that's something that schools and, and you know, more widely, we, we need to do a lot of work on um, on that. Um, I think <clears throat> thinking back to my own educational years in subjects that I knew I was well versed on, then I probably thrived in the examination when I was able to perform under pressure. Um, in subjects I was less well versed on, I'm thinking languages, I was awful at languages, I fell apart, you know, and, and that's probably because I didn't know my stuff and I allowed the moment to get on top of me. I think some of the most pressured moments in your life are things like your driving test. That's a very yeah. pressured moment. And, and actually, how do you, it's you and, and there's no one there to do it for you. And I think that's a moment that a lot of people feel pressure. So interesting. You talk about the exams and obviously that's the system that you're operating. I mean, you said some really interesting things. You said you felt that the education system woefully um, underserved our young people in helping them be uh, better under pressure or manage themselves under pressure um, and I mean you and I did this project didn't we together three years ago when you were working in an all-girls school and we were abs- actively addressing how with your you know how how can we help these young women uh, come into just the environment what I what struck me so much actually was that when we set it up as an exam hall when they weren't expecting it and we watched the girls come in and it, I think you and two other male, and I'm being very specific here, male members of staff walked into the into the hall and sort of went, oh, right, exam. There was a sort of like very positive response to that. And when the girls walked in, there was an absolute sort of shock of sort of silence, of real surprise and almost backing out. I want to talk a bit more about the project with the year 11 girls that Alan and I just referenced. When we'd set up the school hall as if for an exam, I was expecting some kind of reaction, but the strong physical change I saw in the girls was genuinely shocking. I could hear them chatting and laughing amongst themselves as they approached the hall, but when they opened the door, the change was palpable. Their faces and shoulders dropped, they were hesitant, smiles turned to grimaces, and some even tried to turn back. It's so important to remember the power an environment can have on our ability to stay in control. If I'm due to give a talk or run a team event, I know that if I can get into the space beforehand, connect with it, that helps me own it. I'm managing the environment as opposed to it managing me. That's why we set up the space as an exam hall when the girls weren't expecting it, so they could recognise in advance the impact an environment can have on their ability to perform under pressure to forge a different, more familiar relationship with the space, one that would not disrupt their focus, one that would enable them to take more control of the situation next time. Now, back to our conversation. Now you're working as a head teacher in a boys' school. I suppose I am quite intrigued as I've got you in front of me, Alan. <laughs> What's been your perception of pressure for young women through the educational system and pressure for young men? through the education system. Do you think there's anything that we can draw from that? I think loads. I think, you know, what's been fascinating for me is um, obviously my early years of teaching were mixed. Then I did uh, sort of six or seven years in girls. Now, I mean, it's, it's becoming mixed, but our older year groups are boys. Uh, we're still quite boy heavy at the moment. So only year seven and eight are mixed. Nine, 10, 11 are boys only. So if you take girls, for example, when we were doing the work in the girls school, uh, mm. the anxiety of failure dominates their kind of approach to their preparation and their performance in the exams and there's there's a real fear from a very early point in in key stage four and possibly even before which is is driven by fear of of not doing well and actually that that is that is quite sort of holding them back Mm. um I tried to launch a project of uh, brave not perfect uh the girls school which was it doesn't matter right up until the last moment when you're sat in that exam space it doesn't matter how wrong you are or whether you don't get everything right because it's all rehearsal um and it only matters on one one occasion which is the last occasion and what I was encouraging girls to do really was um, step towards errors in the classroom and actually take them on as a positive learning experience because you get a lot of, of young ladies who will only contribute if they know they're right. 
um, that kind of fear of not not being correct does drive a lot of their patterns of behaviour. Um, and so the anxiety around girls towards education really worried me, and I still think it's it's an issue. Um, and I think that's been exacerbated by um, the pandemic and this kind of narrative of lost learning um, and catch up, um, which has not been helpful to them sort of in preparation for the next set of public exams whenever they come, which is likely to be this year. So I think the girls get get um, a lot of them. I wouldn't say everyone because some of them some of them don't, but a lot of them get so uh, concerned by not doing well that it actually has a really detrimental effect on kind of their preparation and what they can achieve um whereas boys you have the opposite issue trying to get them as an early point to engage with revision or trying to sort of see that being well planned and well prepared will help them um you get some of them that do step onto that but a number of them will leave it till later and later and they will only jump onto that agenda sort of february march and then hope to be able to revise their content and get themselves ready within like eight ten weeks yeah. Whereas the girls will start that process far earlier and they'll be revising diligently for, for the whole of the year 11 or a lot of them will be. So, yeah, I find I find the boys are perhaps, um, you know, I'm talking in, in a majority sense, mm -hmm. uh, more fl more flippant and more kind of it will be all right as a culture and an attitude. Whereas the girls, um, I think they get very anxious about it. Um, and that's why sometimes a mix setting sort of calms the girls somewhat and elevates the boys somewhat because that right. kind of anxiety around doing well kind of seeps into the boys and that calmness of the boys thinking don't worry about it we'll get there sometimes levels the girls so yeah, yeah I do I have found in the settings that I've worked in um mixed settings sometimes brings out that kind of approach really but yeah it's been fascinating um yeah I'm sure the differences. And I'm sure actually and and um it raises so many questions <laughs> doesn't it as to why that is and what what can an education system do to prepare that differently I mean I feel as much as I have had some hideous moments of pressure I think I always know that I will be better as a result of it if I can handle it if I can stick in with it if I can um, allow myself to feel hideously uncomfortable I sort of believe that ultimately I will be better for it and I, th I think understanding what that is for each individual and that's partly what's prompted this this podcast for me is just to share the variety of ways that people can remain at their best despite or because of pressure i mean if we could do something with the education system particularly in in very challenging comprehensives what 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 could we do uh first of all you've got to you've got to get people out of a mindset of replication what, what we've done in education for a long time uh, and, and teachers as much as as parents etc is just replicated their own experience mm -hmm. and one of my colleagues ha has a very simplistic way of putting it which i love which is you only know what you know mm -hmm. so therefore if that's what you did to revise 20 30 years ago that's likely to be what you pass on to those that you're you know if you're a parent to your own child um, or if you're a teacher and you've never looked at it differently, then you replicate what you've done before. And I think, therefore, you've got to educate. You know, you're probably not surprised that as someone in education, I think that education is the key. But you've got, to, you've got to get people to understand that actually simple things like telling students they've only got 10 weeks left and they better hurry up and revise, otherwise it's going to be too late, brings on an anxious response. Mm. Whereas if you tell students you've still got 10 weeks to do something about this, let's help you get there. And you change that narrative to what you can do rather than a fear of what won't what will happen as a consequence then you can make very different inroads i think i think for me schools and and parents because you need a common message going to children you can't have a conflicting message you need to work with young people on yes understanding content and a little bit like we did when we did the project at the girls school but what are you going to do when you meet the question that you don't know Mm. What are yes. what are you going what are you going to do when when your bus is late that day and you're flustered, and what are you going to do if you're not feeling a hundred percent that morning when you're not well slept, and actually you know controlling what you're able to control, i.e. thinking about scenarios that could happen and having a plan, yeah. um, is actually really important and 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 that's probably not spoken about enough in mm. my view. Yeah. Um, 
And it's all about revise this topic. You don't know that well enough, which is fine, but and, and necessary. I, I know it's necessary, but it's not going to be what saves somebody in the moment when when question one's horrendous and they don't really know where to go with it. And that knocks their confidence. And then they put some on the back foot for the rest of the paper. Um, and, and you've really got to sort of learn skills of um, that's just one question. Let's get on to the questions you do know. Keep yourself calm. Maybe you practice your box breathing, whatever it is that you yeah. use to kind of bring yourself back into regulation. Uh, and I don't mean just tell them once and expect mm. them to remember it. I mean, actually, over a period of time, um, three, four, five months, however long you can, keep reiterating that message. Because we all know that in the moment, you need simple things to follow. You don't need anything complicated. You need something that you can just say or remember. And, and I read a lot for my, my job, as you know. And I was fascinated by even, even the special forces use box breathing yeah. behind yeah. enemy lines. And you yeah. sit there thinking, if it's good enough for the special forces, <laughs> yes. it's, good, it's good enough for year 11s and it's good enough for year 12s and 13s. So yes. I, I find it fascinating that there's not enough time spent on managing self, in which is probably most people's most pressured moment up until the age of 60, yeah. you know, is, is exams. So yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that's that's something that we could spend an awful lot more time doing. And I don't mean one afternoon I mean constant drip yeah. fed message um over time yeah yeah I totally agree with you so that's how you um are helping the young people in your care um manage and lead themselves better under pressure as a head teacher Alan you you mentioned quite a few audiences right at the very beginning of this conversation mm -hmm. and obviously you've got your staff your definition of pressure might be different from somebody else's pressure or what you might find not remotely pressurizing is hugely pressurizing for somebody that you're leading or somebody in your staff or someone in your team. How do you lead others in your staff um, to deal with pressure? I think you're right. I think what some people find pressured, other people find very simple. And I think mm -hmm. vice versa, something that I might find stressful, I probably have someone who I work with who for them it's water off a duck's back. I think it works several ways. I really am not sort of aligned to the concept that some people are just great at everything. I, I don't necessarily no. believe that at all. I think we all just see life slightly differently. Um, so I think I think one of the things that I do a lot of is share, share the fact that these things are learned <clears throat> and, they're, and they're things that can be practiced and rehearsed and they're not something that you will always be bad at. And if if what, what most educators fear um, is Ofsted, okay. quite frankly, that, that's if you if you go into most schools, um, there's there's almost an irrational fear of Ofsted um, and, and actually one that's probably not justified. But uh, families and, and, and parents don't really know where else to look if they're trying to look for a school. It's, it's something they, they understand and right. they can read an Ofsted report and they can see like a judgment made on a on a school. So therefore, you have to accept that the audience is important because you want things to refavor a bit about your institution. So I work with a lot of teachers for whom Ofsted is a huge fear um, and not because uh, they don't think the school's any good or they don't think the school will do well, but because you're so on show for that yes, day, yes. that two days, you know. Yes. And people deal with it in the most unhealthy of ways. So that they, they will sacrifice sleep they will sacrifice their food and their diet. They probably, teachers won't eat for two days. You'll see, you know, staff around school just really kind of um, in, in almost um, crisis mode, just thinking, God, I want to get this right. And it's not for any other reason other than they want it to go well. You know, I've not worked with any any educators who, are, who are, want anything else um, other than a good Ofsted. So a lot of what I'm doing at the moment is, is kind of um, Ofsted are going to come. <laughs> that's going that's going yeah. to happen so yeah. let's take that off the table because it's just a known it's going to happen so i'm doing some work at the moment because the way that ofsted inspections work at the moment is um you know they're not necessarily going to ask me about my views on the school because they'd expect me to wax lyrical about it they're going to they're going to go and ask my middle leaders and they're going to ask my teachers they're going to go and mm. ask my parents they're going to triangulate that with the children you know they're not they're not yeah. <clears throat> in the new sort of framework they're not so much interested in the most senior of leaders because they're almost expecting you to be well versed. I think that's probably <laughs> quite quite a savvy approach. So, yeah. um, so what I'm doing a lot with my middle leaders is is saying, well, it's going to happen. 
So therefore, let's start getting you ready to kind of take take them by the hand rather than be done to. Okay. Um, and, and think, what do you want them to know? What what are you going to say to the offset inspectors? Because you're really proud of that. Um, and rather than wait for the series of questions where you feel like you're being um, interrogated or, or sort of interviewed, actually think about what you are going to make sure you put in front of them so that you can own part of that process. Um, yes. And, I, and I, I sort of talk very openly to my staff. What's the worst question Ofsted could ask you? And think about, well, what's your response to that going to be if it does come? Because if you, if you start there, then you hopefully get progressively uh, towards easier questions, if you like. So, yeah, yeah lots of that kind of um, safe, safe conversations um, around around, you know, being prepared for those moments, I think, is, yes. is one of the things that I do a lot of. I love that. That's that's almost like real rehearsal, isn't it? It's like imagining the what ifs. Let's put it straight down in front of us and let's just practice what we can say in response to that um which which is a bit like a drill isn't it I suppose it's a bit like what you're talking about with your sport you practice you go over and over and over it and then you just increase the pressure the, the sooner it gets closer to the final or closer to the to the game it's the same for Ofsted I presume it's the routine yes it's, it's you know we feel very centered in in habit so therefore if I can if I can make my habit that I ask myself tough questions and I prepare for the tough questions and I think about what I'm going to do when I get a tough question, if I can prepare for those things, then when it happens, I don't get that fight or flight mode. I, yeah. I get that. I get a much calmer sort of response. But also thinking like one of the things that I think is really important, especially if you're in a leadership role, is we're going to get that phone call at midday, one day, and they'll be in the following. So, you know, things I can yes. do is take some of the stuff off the table we'll make sure that even simple things like we put food in the staff room and we'll put bottles of water around the school because you're then taking care of people's kind of well-being from us or they're putting fuel in them when they probably won't have time to get to a shop or they won't have time to food prep so you can do things like that and, and they know that that's going to happen staff know that that's going to happen so that is something that's off the agenda for them so they just have to worry about you know managing themselves from different perspectives so trying to take as much of that away from people in advance you know I've been I've been through five inspections now you kind of mm. learn learn over time um and I was done too in my first inspection I, I vowed never to be done too again so Alan I'd like love you to just try and take us through continual pressure or or a day when you don't feel actually that you're on top form. Um, how, how do you stay in a great space or in the best possible space? What do you actually do? Any day can become pressured. A day that was looking like it was gonna be far, quite straightforward can all of a sudden take a turn for the worst uh, by 9 a.m. So, so all of a sudden you can be in a different world, especially at the moment. You know, at the moment you could walk, walk in on a Monday morning and find that you've not got sufficient staff to operate mm. a school. You know, that, that's perfectly feasible at the moment. So, yes. so pressure, pressure can come at any one time. Um, but I do lots of little things. For example, even being prepared for the day, I will have a range of suits ready, shirts ironed, ties ready. So I'm taking mm -hmm. away problems constantly, food ready. Um, I start my day every day by not opening emails. I, I start my day with what are my priorities for the day. And if I start opening my emails, then I'm giving that to somebody else to yeah. dictate. So I, I choose not to do that. I give myself half an hour, 40 minutes each morning. I, I'm an early start. Starter, I'm usually at my desk by 6.30 and probably till about quarter past seven, I'm just making sure that I know what I want to get done that mm -hmm. day, that week. Um, then I start thinking about my team and what we need to get done. So we talk, we, we talk about that every morning at eight o'clock, but I'm keeping a wider eye on sort of the, the institution. And then I do think about a large part of what I do is I have to influence a change. Um, usually for the better um, and I've lined up uh, probably seven or eight conversations this week that are all about basically having dialogue with people that need to do things differently so that we can be in a better place um, and those meetings will all be to some degree pressured some more than others depending on how senior the person is but also how receptive I know they might be um, which yeah. always adds an element of pressure to it.
Yeah. So yeah, lots of lots of little things. Okay. And how do you recover? Usually I'm pretty good with my my habits, my healthy habits and sort of using exercise has always been a good uh good way that I've found to recover. You know, spending time with my my partner and my little boy is always good to help me recover. Um but but I think that's shifted hugely for me since when I was a, a, a young sort of uh, senior leader. Um, I would have just worked 16, mm. 17 hours and just plowed the time in and would have mm. thought that was the thing to do. Mm. Uh, now, now I actively seek to not do that. Um, and I've, I've realized that I'm much better to everybody if mm. I'm more rested and I've done some things that don't feel like work. And it actually makes me better because often I'll be on a treadmill or I'll be going for a run and I'll have a great idea yes. that I wouldn't have had if I was sat at my desk forcing a great idea. So yes. um, I, I find that it makes me better. Um, joining a nice gym I found really helped. And I know that sounds a bit bizarre, but my old gym was a bit spit and sawdust and I used to just use it functionally. Whereas my new gym is a little bit more frilly. It's got a few more frills okay. to it and it just makes me want to be there more. So it yeah. feels more of a break from the norm. And I found yes. that that had a big impact on me, just mentally uh, allowing me to sort of separate work from relaxation and leisure. You also, Alan, when we talked in preparation for this podcast, you talked about something that you put on <laughs> if, if you need to get a sense of perspective. And it really remained with me ever since you told me that. I wonder if you could just share that story. Um, in my sort of uh, early 30s, my best friend was diagnosed with bowel cancer and, and sadly it was terminal. Um, we lost him in the October of 2012 and his family, because he was such a young man, such a vibrant character. Um, he was a personal trainer, very fit guy um, and, and sadly lost the battle because he was diagnosed too late and it, would, it spread too far. Um, but because he was such a young guy, we had a massive funeral, 400 plus, went to wow. St. Mary's Church, uh, the university we attended. And his parents asked us to wear something orange because uh, that was the colour that he branded his gym with. That was the colour he wore every day. That was kind of his colour. So we all turned up with orange socks on. Uh, I had an orange scarf. I had an orange tie. Um, and we all sort of wore our splash of orange. It's kind of part of his memory. And he was a very strong guy. And I don't mean physically, although he was very physically strong, I mean mentally very strong. Right. And he used to do lots of things because he could, as he would say, mm. I can do it. No one else can. I can. Yes. So I sort of took inspiration from that. And so um, the tie that I wore is bright orange. And, and often if I've got a tough meeting that day, often uh, that, that will be what I'll put on. Uh, if I've got a, a tough decision to make, it just it just kind of yeah. it resonates with me as, as kind of drawing upon the strength that he had, but also the strength that we all had uh, through his illness. So, yeah, I, I, I find it very it's a very visual reminder yeah. of, you know, you need to be strong today. You need you need to bring your A game. You need to be you need to be on it. And I, I use that. Quite frequently, if I'm honest, it probably goes on 10 times a year. Mm. Um, when I really need to sort of, you know, but when I really need to stand tall, puff my chest mm. out and, and be mm. someone who's going to have, you know, to be strong in the moment, that is that is one of the ways that I sort of remind myself that that's what I need to be. I love that example, Alan. Thank you so much. I just think it's such a strong example of how a positive trigger <laughs> that you can literally put on next to your skin and yeah. gives you such a sense of perspective is what, what what I'm hearing from you I think I thought perhaps after I did it the first couple of times it would um it would it would kind of lose its charm or it might it might sort of wear off but actually it's not and this has been I've, I've kind of been in that situation using that mechanism now for probably five or six years you know uh, I've probably worn that same tie to every interview <laughs> that I've been to. Um, it, it is definitely something that has never lost its charm. It's no. it's always something that has, has kind of resonated. And it, I don't know, it's really hard to explain. It just gives you that, that it, for me, it kind of makes me feel like I'm ready. And it kind of makes me feel like I've kind of got 10% more than if I wasn't if I wasn't wearing it. It's really strange. I can't explain it. I think sometimes that's what we need to remind ourselves that the pressure is okay. In, yeah. it's, a, it's a real sense of perspective and a choice. Yeah, so I just think it's necessary. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
it's necessary to have pressure in your life. It's necessary. I can imagine some people listening to that and thinking, you know, well, not agreeing. <laughs> but the fact, you know, but it's quite a useful mantra, it sounds. Yeah, pressure just, is necessary for you. I think for me, um, what, what I'm trying to get all of the time is progress. And progress very rarely comes from a comfort zone. Usually it comes from a discomfort. Uh, so if you want to make progress, you've kind of got to get used to the discomfort um, that comes with it. And over time, it becomes less discomfort. The discomfort becomes less, you know. Yes. Brilliant. So, um, Alan, I've been asking everybody this question and I'd love your response. But if somebody's listening to this podcast who wants to be better under pressure, what two things, if you could choose two things that you could carry forward or pass forward in relation to the way we can all be better under pressure what would you offer i think i think honestly the thing that keeps me sort of sane and managing it is is preparation i guess if i was talking to my younger self i would have done more of that because i allowed it to happen in the moment and then wanted to manage it well and actually through experience i've realized that even more recently i've allowed um situations of pressure to kind of not be dealt with in in preparation as well as i would like them to have because i've I've overthought it and actually thinking about the steps the routine that i do in advance of pressure i think a version of that that suits somebody is is definitely the thing that i would encourage thinking that it's probably going to happen at some stage i'm going to be in a pressured situation and what am i going to say how am i going to hold myself great and the second thing you'd pass forward um (laughs) it's not unlinked to the first one but but accepting that you are going to at some stage end up in a moment of pressure and, and they, there's something you can do, then I think that's trying to avoid it probably for most people makes it far worse, I think. Yes, yes. To anticipate it so that you can then mitigate the strength of it, potential strength of it. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Alan, thank you very much. It's been really useful understanding from your perspective Um, how the various different elements of pressure interrupt or add into your day or help you grow. And um, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. No, thank you. It's really interesting. I loved it. Thank you. Before we finish, I just wanted to pick up on one thing that Alan emphasized, the power of language. He talked about the post pandemic narrative around education, phrases like catch up and lost time and the impact those phrases had on teachers, students and parents. I spend a great deal of time coaching clients to be more intentional about the language they use in moments of pressure and how they can turn any pressure they're experiencing into something they feel they can control. Yet only this morning, I found myself saying to my daughter, who has a driving test in two months, but it's only two months away. I just blurted that out. If I thought about it, I could have been more helpful to her by saying, You still have two months to improve and be ready for the test. I'd allowed my sense of the pressure to leak out and increase the pressure that she was already feeling. Well done me. It just reminds me though of how fallible we all are to feelings of pressure and of the huge part that language can play in our ability to turn pressure into a force for good. It's vital to choose the words we use. Thanks again, Alan. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne-Rowe. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method. Alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening and until next time, goodbye.